Heavenly Father, we beseech thee. I kneel before you as a member of this age-old craft, praying to you for guidance as I am on a journey. A journey for more light, but more especially light that has been lost, forgotten, or hidden among the ages gone by. The light that connects us with our very meaning and informs us of our purpose. Light locked deep within our past, beyond lips that no longer speak, and paths forgotten, no longer traveled. Aid me in my pursuit, Lord, for historical light. Everybody, welcome back to Historical Light, an independent Masonic show focused on the historical events and aspects within Freemasonry. As always, I'm your host, Brother Alex Powers. I want to thank you guys for joining us again. Today is episode number 24. We're going to be talking about this guy, William J. McClintock. Before we get into the episode, though, let's jump over to our friends, as we always do, from MasonryToday.com and see just what happened in Masonic history today. Today in Masonic history, John Boyd Dunlop is born in 1840. He was a Scottish-born and educated inventor, born February 5, 1840, in Dreghorn, North Ashire, Scotland. At a young age, he was informed that he was a premature baby, being born almost two months early. This caused Dunlop to be convinced in his life that his health was always in a very fragile state, and he acted accordingly. He never developed any serious illness through his life, so it's unclear what convinced him that his health was so fragile. He studied to be a veterinary surgeon at the School of Veterinary Studies in the University of Edinburgh. After graduating, he worked as a veterinary surgeon for almost 10 years before moving to Ireland. In 1867, he moved to Downpatrick, Ireland, there to establish a new veterinary practice that by the mid-1800s was said to be one of the largest practices in all of Ireland. In 1887, Dunlop made his most well-known invention, the pneumatic tire. Dunlop was already familiar with working with rubber through his veterinary practice. One day in October, he decided to make a tire for his son's tricycle. After creating the tire, a rubber-filled air tire, he rolled one down the hill next to his son's metal tire along the grass. The pneumatic tire traveled further than the metal tire and was only stopped by a gatepost. Dunlop created a second tire put both on the tricycle, discovering that the tricycle moved more easily as well. He was granted a patent for this design in 1888. By 1889, Dunlop had started making larger tires for bicycles, and they were being used for racing. In 1889, William Hume demonstrated the tires by winning races in England and Ireland. This brought the tire to the attention of Harvey Ducross. He would become Dunlop's business partner. The two built a company together and worked until 1890 when they hit a problem. Dunlop was informed that his patent was being taken away because someone had already been granted a patent in France and the United States almost 40 years earlier. Despite the setup of the two men, the, they pushed through and the pneumatic tire and booth cycle agency were revived by Ducross. Dunlop, by 1895, had retired and given Ducross control of the entire business, although Dunlop did continue to have a stake in the company to a degree. In 1896, Ducross sold the business for three million pounds. Ducross remained the head of the company, and in the early part of the 20th century, it was renamed to Dunlop Rubber. Dunlop passed away on October 23rd of 1921. It was said that he caught a chill and died from it. Dunlop was a member of the Lodge of Harmony in Belfast, Ireland. All right, well, thank you again to our friends over at masonrytoday.com for another great article. Definitely make sure you check them out on their website and social media as well so you can keep up with those great articles they put out on a daily basis. Now that we got that in, let's go ahead and jump over and pay the bills. Historical Lights brought to you in part by viewers like you. So if you like what we do here want to see us continue and grow, you yourself can help support the show by going to our website, historicallight.com. Click on the uh, Support Us tab up in the main menu bar, and you can give to the show securely and safely through the means of PayPal, either on a one-time basis or by a reoccurring 
donation. We definitely appreciate everything you're willing to give to the show, and for everyone that does give already, thank you so much. You make this all possible. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us for episode 24. I don't have an interview today. What I wanted to focus on was an important member that I've researched ever since I came to Gardner Lodge, and uh, one that really means a lot to the Lodge, who I kind of was able to discover who he was. So this photo behind me is a photo that has been here for many, many years. When I came in, nobody could tell who it was. I know a few of you have heard me tell this story before, but this photo means a lot to the Lodge. And when I started in on the history search of this Lodge, the main thing that really started me on wanting to do this history was our past masters photos. As a lot of you know, you go into lodges and the past master photos is one of the most pride-ridden things you have to show the history of the lodge. For Gardner Lodge coming into their 150 years, this is what we had. Obviously, not enough photos to fill the 150 years, and even within there, we got quite a few blanks. Well, I noticed this one up here got a collective 12 years of service in the East. That's pretty impressive, yet we had no photo. So going through and trying to search all these names of missing photos, I'd searched McClintock's name so many times and really came up with next to nothing. We had found his obituary through the county, but really no information on him or you know about his life, and definitely not a picture at that point. So I was pretty fortunate one day after searching his name so many times in the past, I tried it again, and this time I got a search result for a uh, member that also belonged to a uh, fraternal society called the Grand Army of the Republic. For those of you that aren't aware, the Grand Army of the Republic is a fraternal society for those that served in the Civil War as well. And there was a post right here in my town of Gardner, Kansas, and it had a photo of a reunion of theirs, and in the back row, second to the left, was a W.J. McClintock. Well, I knew at that time that name had to be pretty rare, and this town had a very small population, so I was on to something. The funny thing was, when I enlarged that photo and looked at the person second to the left, this is the man I saw. That beard is non-mistakable. So I want to honor today's episode, since we don't have a full uh, interview to go through, I really wanted to honor this guy, because he means the world to me, and he means the world to this lodge, especially now that we all know who he is again, and he has uh, presided over us for so many years now. You know, I got I to gotta give a shout out to my youngest daughter. She's for those that you think that you are, she's actually the biggest fan of the show, has watched every single episode. Ashlyn, come here. Oh. Say hello to your fans. Hello. Hello. You watch every episode of Historical Light? Yeah. Yes, you do. Biggest fan? Yeah. High five. Now, what do you do every single time you come in this lodge? Say hi to him. Say hi to McClintock. What do we do when we leave every single time? Say bye. Say bye. Every time we come in this lodge, I usually give McClintock a little salute, and she'll follow behind and do the same. And if we walk out of here and forget to say bye to him, this little girl right here will run back in, turn the light back on, and make sure she says bye. Because she understands that level of respect and has respect for this guy. So we're going to go through, read his obituary that kind of tells a little bit about his life, and let you guys bask in the honor of past master W.J. McClintock. And now for some parts from the obituary of W.J. McClintock. William J. McClintock passed away peacefully at rest at his family home Thursday afternoon, December 2, 1926, after a long and useful life had come to a close, a life rich in those things that do not perish with the body. Born in Pennsylvania in 1838, he moved with his parents to Illinois at the age of 16, and when Abraham Lincoln called for volunteers to put down the rebellion, he was quick to respond, enlisting at the age of 23 into the Company B, 33rd Illinois Infantry, and served until the close of the war. In 1868, came to Johnson County, Kansas, and for nearly 60 years was an honored resident of this very community. Having fought to preserve the Union, he set himself with seriousness of purpose for fulfilling in his worthy place in life. Knowing that a nation is only as strong as the citizens which unite to compose it, he sought by industry, honor, and observance of Christian virtues to be worthy of the citizenship of this great nation which he had helped preserve. He was one of the earliest members of the Gardner Methodist Church, one of the earliest and perhaps oldest living members of the Gardner Masonic Lodge, and became a member of the O.B. Gardner Post, Grand Army of the Republic, upon its organization. No man was more faithful in church attendance, it was said. And then this picture I'll put up on the screen here. I was really lucky to receive these 
uh, Dylan from the Grand Lodge, our archivist, sent me all the Grand Lodge official membership cards for our past masters and everything. And Man, these are just really invaluable, and we really appreciate that the uh, Grand Lodge would provide us with these. It means the world. Um, but we show here, and you guys can see it on the screen as well, says McClintock, William J., Gardner Lodge number 65, was admitted into the Lodge December 20th of 1871. Uh, shows all the years that he served. Um, we have on here that he died December 2nd, 1926. Under his official record, it starts off 1872 was his first office as senior deacon. Served 1873 as senior warden. Worshipful master, 1874 and 75, and then went to Tyler for 1876. Master again in 77 and 78. Um, and 79 and 81, and then senior deacon for 82, then back to master for 83 and 84. Also served as master 85, 86, 87, 89, and then had another realm in the secretary's chair for 1891 and 92, and then towards the end of his service, he served again as the senior deacon 1897 and 1899. So you guys can tell by looking at this Grand Lodge official membership card, this man was extremely invested in the welfare and betterance of his lodge. It meant the world to him. And even though we didn't know who that was hanging on the wall for the longest time, once we figured it out, it was so crystal clear of why his picture was there. This lodge meant the world to him. And now that we know who it is hanging up there, we can uh, give that honor back and let him know that he also means the world to us. So I'm sure you guys can relate. I know you guys all have that one brother in your lodge's history that uh, is so predominant, probably means the world to you as well. And that's, that's the case here. So I appreciate you guys coming on today and uh, helping me honor this brother and his memory. So I know we didn't have an interview today, but again, I appreciate you guys joining us to help preserve the memory of our brother, William J. McClintock, and everything he did for this lodge. So that's all we have for you tonight. Again, thank you guys so much for coming. And I'm gonna send you guys over to our Facebook group as we always do. That's the Historical Light Masonic Research Group on Facebook. If you're not a member there, click join so we can get you on and you can get into great conversations. But we'll see you there. Until next time, we continue our quest for Historical Light. Have a great night. Brother, until next time.